Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome, and I hope it will become a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Rob Mudde, and as Vice Rector Magnificus of Delft University Technology, it's my privilege to try and moderate today, this evening. Um, and I'd like to start immediately by inviting Ingenieur Marius Enthoven, Chair of the Delft Student Student and Corps Alumni Association, to come forward for his speech. Marius, please. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very pleased that so many of you are here today to attend the fifth Van Hassel lecture. I've been asked in particular to explain a little bit about the history and the purpose of this lecture. And therefore, we have to go back to 1940, 74 years ago. Uh, uh, no, uh, um, even longer, 79 years ago. And uh, exactly on the same date, the 21st of November, the Germans had occupied the Netherlands. And on that date, the German authorities issued a regulation which meant that all the Jewish members of the faculty of our universities had to stop their activities, to stop their professional, and to disappear from the universities. This, of course, affected our technical high school, as Delft in those days was called university, uh, as well. Among the professors who had to be dismissed, was a professor who was particularly popular with the students. His subject was institutional law, which of course was quite a rare subject among the technical faculties that we have in Delft. But the idea behind this was that future engineers had to understand the rule of law, uh, in particular because they had to exert their societal responsibility later on in their career. And this particular professor, Jose Vizieta, was popular for two reasons. First of all, he was of the opinion that none of the students should fail their exams uh, because it was not core business in Delft, institutional law. So all the students, whether they gave right answers or wrong answers, passed the exams. And the second one was that he taught his subject in a non-classical way. He used the daily newspapers and from these newspapers to case studies to explain the basic rules of institutional law. So there is a small anecdote about this professor which will illustrate his popularity. Um, and it goes as follows. One day the rector of the university was informed that all the students of Professor Yeta passed their exams. So he summoned the professor and said, dear colleague, I've been informed that there's no student who fails one of your exams. Is that correct? And then Yeta said, yes, I think so, yes, that's right. Well, dear colleague, you have to understand that in our university, our rate of failure is at least 20 to 25 percent. So I cannot understand why this doesn't happen in the field of institutional law. And then Professor Yeta said, well, okay, uh, uh, I'm not very good in arithmetic and numbers, but if you say so, dear colleague, I will adjust my assessment system. The next afternoon, around four o'clock, a student appeared at his office. He knocked on the door and the professor said, yes, come in. And the student said, my name is De Vries, professor. I am here to do the exam in institutional law. And the professor said, oh, wait a moment. He went to his desk, he scribbled a note, and then gave it to the student. And on the note stood, failed. And the student was, of course, taken aback and said, but professor, you've never asked me 
a question. And the professor said, yes, I know, but unfortunately for you, four of your colleagues have already been here today. They've passed the exam, and um, statistically, you are failing. But if you come back tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, there's a good chance you will succeed. Now, you can understand the popularity of this professor. So um, many of the students who used to take his lecture went on Saturday, two days later, uh, to what they believed would be the last lecture by Professor Yitta in the building of civil engineering. But when they arrived, the professor didn't show up because he had already been summoned that he was not allowed to give any lessons anymore and had gone into hiding. So there was a little bit confusion, but then a small group of students who was the board of the Student Association in Civil Engineering came together and the leader of them, a student of 27 years old, an older student by the name of Franz van Hasselt, took the place of the professor and he delivered a short speech, a kind of statement in which he said that this was a very wrong measure, uh, that we should stand against it, that this was the start of a period of bad practices, of terror, of violation of basic rules, basic standards, and that students should resist it. And he gave, he, this speech was very well received. And... Um, by the time that uh, they had thought about it and were about to leave, one of them took the initiative and said we should take a stand uh, really soon. And then they agreed that they would have a strike on the next morning, Monday, the first day that the real lectures were taking place in the next week. And the strike was a big success. And uh, all the students had been told by each other that they would go on strike. So there was nothing going on in the technical high school and that Monday. For the German authorities, this was a big surprise because they had never seen such a demonstration of civil disobedience yet uh, under their occupation. So they uh, started a big search to find out who was behind it but they never found the originators. Unfortunately, Franz von Hasselt, about nine months later, was arrested because he was befriended with two members of the resistance, and he was then taken to a prison. There was no process. He was taken in what was called Schutzhaft, and he was sent to Buchenwald, where he perished in 1942. Now, all of this has been described in a book which was published six years ago, the book Loyalty in Offense, and this, uh, in Oppression, sorry, Loyalty in Oppression. And when this book was launched, the then former rector of the university and Professor Jeroen van den Hove and myself as initiators of this book and the study behind the book, thought that the book was a good thing to do. The first Franz von Hasselt lecture was delivered at the launch of the book by the late historian Case Vasseur. Um, but we thought that there should be a little bit more if we were to pass on the ideas of Franz von Hasselt and what was behind it, the responsibility for what is going on in society. Uh, to current uh, generations of students. And that beyond the book, it, there should be attention in the curricula and there should be an annual lecture. And the board of the university agreed that there would be an annual lecture. So this is the history of the Franz von Hasselt lecture series uh, on issues which matter to society and make the link between the responsibility of our future engineers and engineers, of course, and society. I would like to welcome in particular 
Professor Robijns, who will deliver later on the lecture, and to Mr. Gerard van Hasselt, who is a direct nephew of the late Frans van Hasselt. And I would now like to pass the floor to the Vice Rector, Professor Mudder, to give a short introduction. Thanks very much, Marius van Enthoven, for reminding us of the occasion and the importance of the annual Van Hasselt Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's um, uh, lecture is organized, as always, with um, Studium Generale TU Delft, together with the Department of Values, Technology and Innovation of the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management. This year's subject, um, as you know, is the purpose of the university in democratic societies. And the purpose of the university, that alone made me think. And as some of the colleagues may tell you, I'm a physicist by background, but I'm also passionate about education. And if you ask me, the purpose of the university is to help, in most cases, young people to develop into critical thinkers with a capacity for self-reflection. There is no such thing as a single absolute truth. So we should help them to become people who are prepared and able to question their own and other people's views. How do we do that? I think that the way in which we couple research and education at our university and at many other research universities play a vital role here. It helps our students in searching for answers themselves, answers on questions that their mentors, supervisors, teachers also are not able to directly answer. And it's that process that helps people in the final stage of the studies to become the independent thinker, the critical ones. And it's important as we believe that our students um, ultimately will be among the leaders of this country and they will have to shape the future when at least I step back. Of course, students shouldn't have to question everything. They can safely rely on the law of conservation of energy and neither should they doubt the established parameters of scientific research. What we do want to teach them is how they can make their own analysis and that they can discover hidden assumptions by asking the right questions. Let me dwell a bit on an example, a triangle. I guess we all know and agree that the sum of the angles of a triangle is exactly 180 degrees. Always, isn't it? And the answer is no, it isn't. Join me in um, a walk on the Earth. We start at the North Pole, it's about the temperature that we feel here, um, and we move in a straight line to the equator. Then we turn left, a 90 degree corner, I guess you all agree. We walk half, quarter, that's easier, a quarter of the acre, equator, and then turn left, another 90 degree angle. So we already have the 180 degrees. We keep on walking, now again in northern direction, and sooner or later we'll be back at the North Pole where we started. Another 90 degree angle. So the sum of these three angles, of this triangle that we walk, is 270 degrees. You've all been fooled with the 180 degrees. What is the morale of this story? It depends on the context, depends on the assumption. I talked you in 180 degrees in what's called Euclidean geometry. But the globe as such, the sphere, is non-Euclidean and it doesn't hold. And that's exactly what we like our students to be able to question. All right, context matters and it's important for them to, to be able to, to see that. And it doesn't stop here. Um, I sincerely believe that as a university we should also dare to embrace our independent thinkers who go against the grain 
and who are not afraid to shake up established thinking and change our views of the world. Indeed, it's such people that we have to thank for much of our scientific progress. Take an example and move into the world of quantum mechanics and they are full of assumptions that don't no longer hold and are counterintuitive. But I digress a little bit. As a university, we should encourage our students to become the critical contextual thinkers with a sense of value. And we should foster the occasional truly independent thinkers. Or, in the words of Professor Arthur Lehman Goodhart, master of Oxford University in the 1950s, the purpose of university in teaching is to develop the complete man in the sense in which this phrase was used by the Greek. The complete man is not the man who has the most knowledge, but he is the one who is best equipped to acquire it." End of quote. You could say that in that sense, not all that much has changed since the 1950s, although nowadays we would probably not speak about the complete man, but the complete person. But other than that, it still holds. What has changed very much is the world around us in today's society. We're often confronted with people engaging, engaging in black and white arguments and discussions get out of hand. One of the examples in the discussion um, surrounding us and our Feast of St. Nicholas, more specifically his black helper, uh, Peter is currently ongoing and personally I believe that both sides of the arguments have some merit. I appreciate it's a festive occasion for children who probably are too young to see any harm. But I can also see that blacking up can cause serious offense to others. Point I would like to make is that there is opinions, but there is no exchange of argument. There is no discussion on what it means about mutual understanding, feelings for one another, point of view, trying to understand the other side and seeing whether we can work out something in between. It's missing. Unfortunately, in this time of rising population, many people seem to be attracted to simplistic and author author authoritarian arguments. And I guess we all understand that it's important that we listen to those voicing the unrest in society. But the imperative word here is listen. Trying to understand, realizing that my truth doesn't have to be yours. Our graduates should have this ability to see and understand all points of view. After all, as I said, they're going to be our future professionals, engineers and leaders they should be able to weigh in on the debate and be the voice of reason. So yes, as a university, we should work on increasing the body of knowledge and work on solutions to the world's urgent problems. But our biggest responsibility is to guard our students on that path to becoming critical thinkers. And with those words, I would like to move to the next part, the musical interlude, that is um, brought to us by the ensemble Inter Spinas, who will. Um, oh, they are already there. I was under the impression that you were still in the warmer part of this building because of the instruments. Please welcome Tim Braithwaite, Cornel van Neste, Hidde Kleinkamp. Thanks very much, wonderful. And they'll be back, ladies and gentlemen. We are very proud to have Professor Ingrid Robijns here with us tonight, who will deliver this year's Van Hasselt Lecture. And I hope and I expect she will go deeper into the issues that are hidden in the title, the purpose of the university in democratic societies. But before I invite her to come to the stage, let me introduce a little bit of her background to you. Professor Robijns holds the chair in Ethics 
of Institutions at Utrecht University. At the beginning of her career, she studied economics because she thought that would be a good field to contribute to improving the world. However, by the time she finished her economics degree, she had some issues with the subject. She thought it was rather detached from the real world and left li little room to ask what she considered to be important questions. For example, where she, where she was interested in what would contribute constitute fair prices, economists would simply focus on supply and demand. She went on to do a PhD in philosophy and economics at Cambridge University, where she worked with the Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen. It was Sen who first voiced the capability approach, the idea that the kind of life people are able to lead is dependent on their capabilities rather than, for example, the availability of means. Ingrid Robijns is now the most frequently cited practical philosopher working in the Netherlands, and her work is regarded as very influential. Her research interests lie at the interface of analytical political philosophy, ethics, economics, and gender studies. Most recently, she received 2 million euro for philosophical research on economic and ecological justice, where she will try to answer questions like, can we say, either individually or collectively, that at some point we are polluting too much and using too many natural resources, or that we are having too much wealth? Her research on justice is influential because she also studies notions of immaterial justice, and she raises new issues such as justice between parents and non-parents. And ladies and gentlemen, I could go on trying to list all of her achievements, but I guess you came not here to listen to me, you came to listen to Professor uh, Robijns. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ingrid Robijns to the stage. Dear students, colleagues, citizens, in my lecture tonight, I will not talk about any of the topics that have been mentioned when I got introduced, but I will ask what role the university should play in protecting liberal democracies. Now, we all know what universities are, but the term liberal democracy may not be familiar for everybody here in the room. So let me explain, since it's crucial for the argument that I want to develop. Liberal democracy is a type of political regime that entails two elements. On the one hand, there is the word democracy, which means popular will. Citizens should be treated as political equals and have an equal opportunity to take part in political decision-making, either directly or indirectly. On the other hand, there's the word liberal, and that refers to a set of mechanisms and institutions aiming at protecting individual rights and liberties and procedural fairness, such as the rule of law, the protection of the free press, and other key public institutions, as well as the separation of powers. This set of institutions is especially important to protect minorities against what political scientists call the tyranny of the majority, which is a situation in which the democratic will basically trumps the individual rights of people belonging to minority groups. These rights ensure, and these mechanisms ensure procedural fairness, and they also protect each of us against political abu abuse. Now, political democracy is not the only possible regime type. There are other regime types, such as authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, theocracies, and there are two types of regimes that, according to political scientists, are currently increasing in numbers and in power. The first is undemocratic liberalism, in which citizens have democratic voting rights, but effectively the preferences of the elites dominate political decision-making. And the second is illiberal democracy, 
in which the rights of minorities are no longer protected and the popular elected leaders can enact the will of the people as they interpret it. In illiberal democracies, the ruling leaders have curtailed the capability for criticism of the free press, of independent thinkers, and of a political opponents, and they have weakened the legal system. I will not argue tonight, but rather take for granted that we should strive for liberal democracies. But please note that the word liberal in the word liberal democracy does not refer to an economic liberalism. The term liberal democracy refers to a political system, not to an economic system. These are two distinct issues, even though both have the word liberal in their name, and they should not be confused. A liberal democracy could go together with various economic systems, such as a pure capitalist economic system, or a regulated capitalism, or a form of market socialism, or a for form of property-owning democracy, which is an economic regime which on the one hand has free markets, but in which the ownership of productive capital is widely dispersed among the population. For example, because workers are co-owners, co-owners of companies. There is a large literature in contemporary political philosophy discussing these questions about economic systems, but that is not my topic for tonight. The only thing I want to stress is that the term liberal is used for two different things in an economic sense as referring to the priority of the freedom of enterprise and free markets, and in a political sense, referring to the priority of basic civil and political rights, protection of minorities, and the institutional design that protects those rights with the separation of powers. I will only refer to liberalism in the second sense. I believe that if we keep that distinction in mind and that clarification, we have very good reasons to want to live in a liberal democratic society. On the, on the one hand, we should not want to be ruled by elites, whether they are technocratic elites or financial elites, who decide on policies that the majority of the people do not want after deliberation. So we should not want non-democratic forms of political liberalism. On the other hand, we should also not want to be ruled by undemocratic rulers who take away our individual basic rights and who weaken the balance of powers between different political spheres. We should not want to live in illiberal democracies. That's at least what I believe and what I think is uh, the most defensible position. And therefore, in what follows, I will start from the premise that we should strive for liberal democracies. And I will ask what role the university plays in protecting liberal democracies and how that role is faring. Now, you may think this is very theoretical and abstract, but I hope to convince you by the end of this lecture that this is actually very concrete and considers each of us in this country. There have been times in history in which we did not live in a liberal democracy. For the Netherlands, the last time when this explicitly happened was when our country was occupied by the German occupiers between 1940 and 1945. Many of us, growing up in the second half of the last century, have for a long time held the belief that in Europe, countries that already were or that would become democratic would, re would remain liberal democracies. But I fear that assumption may have been too optimistic. Current scholarship in political science presents us a sobering picture. As the political scientist Kas Mudde shows in his re recent book called The Far Right Today, far right politics is again taking central stage in several countries, such as Brazil, India, and the United States. But it is also increasing its profile and support within Europe. So any of us who had assumed that once you have a liberal democracy, a country will remain a liberal democracy, may have been wrong. We simply cannot take for granted that liberal democracies are stable and that once established, they will never again turn into another political regime. Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, two professors of government at Harvard University, wrote a book called How Democracies Die. 
And in that book, they explain how democracies are inherently vulnerable to being transformed into authoritarian regimes. They show how throughout history and in all continents, political outsiders are invited to share power by mainstream politicians as a strategy of containing those outsiders. Levitsky and Ziblatt ascribe this strategy as being based on, quote, a lethal mix of ambition, fear, and miscalculation, end quote. But they say this strategy tends to backfire, and in all cases, the liberal Democrats are willingly handling over the keys of power to an autocrat in the making. This pattern occurred, for example, with Adolf Hitler in Germany, Alberto Fujimori in Peru, and Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. There are also other cases, such as the case of Viktor Orban in Hungary. In these cases, a politician first serves as a democratic elected leader and acts democratically, and after being in power for a while, he drops the protection of basic rights, he weakens the powers of the journalists and the independent press, and explicitly embraces illiberal forms of democracy or some even authoritarian regimes. What Levitsky and Ziblatt's account of the current stage of political research in political science and political history shows is that liberal democracies are vulnerable, inherently vulnerable, to become illiberal or to become non-democracies by a set of processes that start from the inside out, from within the democracy. Defenders of liberal democracies thus always have to keep reminding themselves that the balance between the protection of basic rights and the rule of law on the one hand, and democratic will on the other hand, is inherently vulnerable in our political system. We therefore must always remain vigilant. But if liberal democracies are inherently vulnerable, as these political scientists say, what should we then do to protect them? In this tiny little book on tyranny, the historian Timothy Snyder gives his reader, readers 20 lessons that we can learn from the 20th century. It's also the subtitle. It says, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and he specializes in the 20th, history, 20th century history of Central and Eastern Europe, including the Holocaust. He has written several lengthy academic books on particular aspects of the wars and the tyrannies that plagued Europe in the first half of that century. But in this little book, he's not addressing his fellow professors in history or his students. Instead, he's addressing all of us, all citizens of democratic societies who like to live in peaceful democracies and who like to enjoy individual freedoms that liberal democracies have brought us. Therefore, he writes in a very accessible and easy way, but with a clear goal to tell his fellow citizens, primarily in the US, but also those in Europe and elsewhere, that they should not take democracy for granted. Snyder has 20 pieces of advice for those of us who want to defend liberal democracies against the risk that they may slide into becoming illiberal, undemocratic, or tyrannies. One of those pieces of advice is defend institutions. Let me quote Snyder. It is institutions that help us to preserve decency, but they need our help as well. Do not speak of our institutions unless you make them yours by acting on their behalf. Institutions do not protect themselves. They fall one after the other unless each is defended from the beginning. So choose an institution you care about, a court, a newspaper, a law, or a labor union, and take its side." End quote. This is what I will do tonight. I will defend the university, the public university, against it being reduced to merely an engine of growth and innovation, or it being stripped of one of its core functions, namely to provide critical analyses of society. But before I embark on that task, I want 
to defend the public university, I want to highlight another lesson that Snyder draws from the 1930s. Lesson number eight is as follows. Stand out. Someone has to, Snyder says. It's e I quote, it's easy to follow along. It can feel strange to do or say something different, but without that unease, there is no freedom, end quote. Snyder gives in his book the example of Winston Churchill, who decided that no matter what, and despite that at that point in time, he had no allies, that the British would fight Hitler. According to Snyder, Churchill's dedication to fight against Hitler inspired the British people to not give up, but to persist. So sometimes a single person or a small group of persons who are courageous enough to speak up can make a difference. Franz van Hasselt did exactly this when in November 1940, he gave a speech here in Delft, which became the start of the student resistance. Other students at other universities in the Netherlands similarly engaged in acts of resistance that put their own life in great danger, and many of them died in concentration camps. It is not difficult to, to interpret the heroic actions of Franz van Hasselt at bo as both the defense of basic liberties of his fellow citizens who were Jewish, as well as a defense of the university in which professors and students work and study in service of the truth, and hence one's religious, ethnic, or other form of personal affiliation should not determine who can teach. Franz van Hasselt paid the highest price for his, for his defense of those liberties and of that institution, because as we already heard, he died in Buchenwald in 1942. In my view, we owe it to Franz van Hasselt and to honor the sacrifices that he and many other students and professors and citizens made in the 1940s to examine critically the current state of our liberal democracies and to ask whether we are properly caring for the institutions that sustain and support liberal democracies. But by now you may wonder, what does all of this have to do with the university? To answer this question, we must first ask, what universities are for. Luckily, throughout history, many scholars have written elaborate books with answers to this question. However, when I read through that, all those books and papers, I found that many are focusing on one particular aspect of the university as the single most important one. I believe that, it, that this is a mistake, that it would be better to defend the university as having multiple functions. I would like to defend the claim that in essence, there are three important functions to the university and that all three are important. Those three functions are, firstly, to pursue curiosity-driven education and research. Second, to contribute to innovation and problem solving in the world. And third, to provide critical analyses of societal issues and processes. So let us start with the first function of the university, curiosity-driven research, education, and um, engagement with society. This type of knowledge is knowledge for its own sake. It could concern any question that a student, a scholar, or a scientist would like to ask themselves. What did the Earth's climate look like 500,000 years ago? What roles do genes play in diseases that we do not fully understand? How does contemporary youth culture change? And what effect does this have on the place young people have in the world? These are the kind of questions that people ask, and there are zillions of these questions that scholars and students are asking themselves. Now, this function of the university has always been defended throughout history by scholars who wrote on the purpose of the university. An influential figure who did this was the German philosopher Karl Jaspers. The worry in that day and age was mainly how the university could avoid becoming an instrument in the hand of either the church or the state, and how it could keep its intellectual independence while often, nevertheless, being financially dependent on either the church or the state. The second function of the university is its innovation and problem-solving function. From this perspective, 
the task of the university is to contribute to groundbreaking innovations, whether or not in collaboration with businesses. According to this view, universities can innovate in mainly two types of ways. Firstly, we could aim for technological innovations, and if one does this in collaboration with companies, they could bring those innovations to the market. And, and a lot of uh, work done on medicine development is on uh, medicine uh, therapies and medications is part of this. Secondly, by devising effective and efficient solutions to all sorts of problems that we are facing in society, and these could be problems of all types of nature, sociologi sociological problems, psychological problems, or climate, or any of these other challenges we are facing. In this way, with this function, universities can promote our material prosperity, but they can also look for solutions to diseases, to ecological problems, urban policy issues, or any other practical challenge. Now, anybody working today in the university will know this function, since as researchers and teachers, we are increasingly required to explain how we make ourselves useful for society. And our research funding increasingly focuses on and requires collaboration with partners from industry or society. The third function is based on the question what the role of the university is in a democratic society, a society in which all people are seen as morally equal. This critical function means that university's task is to hold up a mirror to ourselves, to each other, to society, and to make critical analyses of social issues and developments. The university must carry out research and engage in teaching that enables citizens to make well-informed individual and collective decisions. And the university must form students into critical thinkers who have the ability to, disting to distinguish true from untrue statements, who know how to search for answers to questions in a well-considered manner, and who can put specific issues in a broader context. Sometimes this critical function requires us to look into questions that are very complex and where new scholarship is needed. My own current research fits into this category as I'm asking the question, as I was already said before, whether we could morally and politically justify that there should be upper limits to how rich a person can be. This is a complex question since we have many initial thoughts for reasons why such an upper limit to wealth should or should not exist. Philosophical research that is properly informed by empirical knowledge from a broad spectrum of the social sciences as well as history is needed to assess whether these initial thoughts are solid and survive sustained analysis, or whether they are flawed. This is an example in which curiosity-driven research works in tandem with the critical function of the university. But the critical function of the university often also translates in societal outreach, where we do not need new research. Then what is required is not so much the creation of new knowledge, but rather to apply existing academic knowledge to a concrete case or incident. A recent example is a piece that the legal philosopher Nanda Audians wrote last week in Het Parool, in which she looked at the reactions of politicians and public commentators on the ruling of the Dutch court that the Dutch state has a legal obligation to make an effort to bring the so-called Dutch IS children back to the Netherlands. These are children from Dutch mothers who joined the violent struggle of Islamic State. Dutch politicians of various stripes, including members of the government, expressed being very unhappy with this ruling, and they would prefer not to bring those children back to the Netherlands. In doing so, in making those statements, some were clearly irritated by the fact that the judges because of the separation of powers that we have in liberal democracies, always have to look critically at the political choices that are made. Yet Audience explains that the judges are legally and morally permitted to make this ruling, since one of the tasks of the judiciary in a liberal democracy is to protect the rights of individuals, even if those individuals are from despised minorities against the popular will. It may well be that the majority of Dutch voters 
do not want to take those children and their mothers back on Dutch territory. But the judge always has to critically look at what the rulers decide and test these majority decisions against national and international le legislation. Why would this critical function of the university be important, not just for the universities, but also for society? The answer to that question has been eloquently formulated by Robert Minard Hutchins, who was the president and later the chancellor of the University of Chicago in the period after the Second World War. In 1951, Hutchins published a paper with the title, The Freedom of the University. This is still my most favorite paper that anybody has ever written on the university. So if you ever want to read 10 pages on the university, read this paper. It's published in the journal called Ethics, and you can just get it from the library. Hutchins defined the university as a center of independent thought and held the view that, I quote, a university faculty, faculty being the American term for the staff, university faculty is a group set apart to think independently and to help other people to do so, end quote. He was very clear that even if faculty members make arguments and statements that are not popular with the public, they should ret retain the freedom to do so. However, what's more important is that Hutchins argued that this freedom of the university is important for society itself, rather than only for the members of the university. Let me quote him at a little more length. Universities, such centers of independent thought, are indispensable to the progress and even the security of any society. Perhaps the short lives that dictatorships have enjoyed in the past are attributable as much to this as to any other single thing. Dictatorship and independent thought cannot exist together, yet no society can flourish long without independent thought. Independent thought implies criticism, and criticism is seldom popular, especially not in times of war or of danger of war. Then every effort is made to, form, to force conformity of opinion upon the entire population, and the country often goes into an ecstasy of tribal self-adoration. This loss of balance is unfortunate for the country." End quote. Now, we need to know that the context in which Hutchins wrote this was a historically very specific context in which anyone, was suspect, anyone who was suspected to have communist sympathies was no longer sure that they could keep their job. Hutchins argued that this great good of independent thought was under threat, since there was a general atmosphere of repression caused by so-called McCarterism at American universities. Yet the argument that the freedom of the university is not only crucial for the very essence of the university itself, but also for a healthy democracy and society, is still valid today, as I will try to show you in a minute. So let me just summarize what I've said about the functions of the university. I believe that we can say that the university has three functions. First, it's, the first function is knowledge acquisition and uh, spreading and teaching driven by curiosity. Secondly, aiming at innovation and problem solving. And thirdly, providing critiques of societal questions. I believe that all three functions have a legitimate place at university. All three are important and all three apply to the three main tasks of the university, research, teaching, and societal outreach or societal service. Now, I, do, I want to stress, because I do not want to misunderstood, that I am not contesting the innovation and problem-solving function of the university. But in recent de decades, I believe that that innovation function has become too dominant. Many contemporary scholars who write books on the topic, such as Stefan Collini's What Are Universities For? or Martha Nussbaum's book Not For Profit, lament that universities are increasingly judged for their contribution to economic production through innovation or for contrib contributing to solving practical problems in society. And the governmental policies in the Netherlands also see universities primarily through the lens of innovation and problem solving. 
Now, I'm making this claim, but what evidence do I have for this claim in relation to the Netherlands? I will give you just a few pieces of the evidence that I have. First, a significant amount of research funding goes to the so-called top sector, and now more recently also to the what's called the Nationale Wetenschapsagenda. Top sector are economic areas in which the Netherlands is considered to be strong. The Dutch Research Council, NWO, allocated 550 million euros over 2018 and 19 to this type of research that brings industry and scientists together. Second, for grant applications at NWO, the importance of showing how what one wants to do affects societal issues or how it will meet needs that society has, has increased over time. Dutch scholars across the disciplines have complained that curiosity-driven research is under pressure, which is in part, of course, also due to the fact that academic research in general is underfunded with at least 1 billion euros structurally. To be precise, 1.15 billion euros, according to WEO and AXI, which is an activi activist group of scholars and students, or 1.5 billion euros, according to the VSNU, the Association of Dutch Universities. So somewhere between 1.15 and 1.5 billion. Third, in the Netherlands, the organization of entrepreneurs is in a structural networking platform with the universities. But societal organizations, such as to name just a few, Amnesty International, or disability rights organizations, or organizations protecting the rights of children, or refugees, or animals, or climate, or anything else, are not. What justifies this special treatment and this greater power given to the lobby of the entrepreneurs over the lobby of organizations defending the rights of public causes or vulnerable groups? I've asked this question many times, and apart from pragmatic answers, such as we may be able to, to let the industry to contribute more to R&D, I still haven't come across a valid reason. So, curiosity-driven research and education is the other type of research, and I believe it is recognized by the government as a fundamental task for universities. But what we see here is that universities are finding it increasingly difficult to obtain sufficient funding for this type of research. And the Minister of Higher Education and Research usually wants this fundamental research to ultimately lead to something that's useful for society and that contributes to the university's innovation function. Moreover, we see a tendency for curiosity-driven research to ultimately be valued in an instrumental way though perhaps more in a probabilistic sense. It's seen as research that serves as a starting point for which has the potential for innovation-oriented research in the future. Now, while curiosity-driven research and teaching may have been neglected, although I think in terms of teaching, we still have a lot of autonomy on what we teach, and I don't think we are adapting our curriculum a lot, but in the area of research, it does really make a difference. While curiosity-driven function of the university may have been neglected, I think that the critical function of the university is actually worst off. Because, it, because not only has the critical function been neglected by some administrators or politicians, it has also come under attack from other angles. And that is not only an essential threat to the universities, it's a threat to democratic societies. The critical function is the most vulnerable of the three functions of the university because there will always be powerful parties in society that want to maintain their power and that feel threatened by critical analysis. And this is precisely why academic freedom is so incredibly important. After properly using the scientific method and keeping up with academic standards of truth-seeking, exchanging argument, receiving criticism, etc., scientists must be able to say what they believe follows from their analyses, even if that message is not what some people like to hear. It's clear that not everyone is fond of the critical function of the university. On a small scale, we see that companies and organizations that are funding research sometimes exert subtle pressure to choose a more favorable focus or to use less sharp formulations in the conclusions. 
At the political level, history has shown that authoritarian regimes and tyrannies prefer to abolish the critical function altogether. Remco Breuker, who is a professor of Korea studies in Leiden, clearly shows this in his book, The BV North Korea. He shows how the humanities are effectively dead in, Korea, in North Korea. Yes, nominally there are historians, but they have no choice but to write propaganda for the great leader, because otherwise they are at a very high risk to pay with it with their own lives. Dictators, tyrants, leaders with megalomania must try to suppress the social sciences and the humanities because those do research that results that can undermine their political goals. This explains why scholars from the humanities and the social sciences in Turkey have to be so careful and some are self-censoring. And it also explains why in Hungary Viktor Orban's government has made it impossible for the Central European University to keep working in Budapest. They have now effectively moved to Vienna. This university puts research and education on human rights, democracy and the rule of law at the heart of its mission. This is unwelcome for Orban, who is striving for an illiberal democracy in which civil rights and individual freedoms are drastically curtailed. Now, I started this lecture by mentioning that the term liberal democracy stands for a society that gives everyone an equal share in democratic decision making and that protects minorities against the risk of a tyranny of the majority. And I also said that this protection is provided by constitutionally laid down fundamental rights and freedom which are secured through the legal system. The university, together with the free media and press, are important institutions in liberal democracies because their task is to analyze whether the freedoms of citizens are still guaranteed, whether governments operate democratically, and whether political actors do not proclaim falsehoods and spread propaganda. On the one hand, the critical function of the university disturbs the plans of politicians who want to implement policy in a technocratic manner for which there is no democratic basis. So these are the non-democratic liberal regimes. It's then up to the journalists and the academics to analyze and criticize this, as happened, for example, after the technocratic European follow policies that followed the last financial crisis. There were many of our colleagues in economics and political economy who criticized what exactly was happening there. And I think it's also part of the debate about the questions that some people have about legitimacy of, of EU policies. On the other hand, the critical function of the university and the media also irritates political parties that do not care about individual civil rights at all, including some that are nostalgic for regimes that severely restrict these individual rights and freedoms. From the work of philosophers, political scientists and historians, such as Jason Stanley, Timothy Schneider, Stephen Levitsky, Daniel Zeblatt and many others, we learn that democratically elected politicians with totalitarian aspirations first suppress the civil rights and individual freedoms before they can move on to an authoritarian regime. They do this by systematically under undermining the public institutions that are crucial to finding the truth and protecting these individual rights. Think specifically about attacking academics, journalists, judges, lawyers, politicians from other parties, and all organizations that work with independent knowledge or that aim at the protection of individu individual fundamental rights, especially those of minority groups. If these institutions are sufficiently weakened, and as a result, the resistance to spreading propaganda has also diminished, then these illiberal parties can further strengthen their grip on power through the use of propaganda manipulation. It is crucial for us to realize that in the past, many dictatorships used to take power starting from within the democratic system. Liberal democracy is, as I said, inherently vulnerable to processes of, processes of propaganda, lies and framing because it allows the tyranny of the majority to reign through the ballot box. And this is why it's crucially important that citizens, politicians, judges, academics and journalists defend these core institutions of liberal democracies. 
It is, as Timothy Schneider tells us, the second lesson on how we can protect liberal democracies, defend institutions, defend the free press that separate lies from truths, defend the lawyers that ensure that access to justice for all is guaranteed, defend the universities so that they are not reduced to their innovation function, but can also continue to perform their critical function. You may now agree or not agree, but suppose you agree or you think it's plausible, all I've said so far. You may ask yourself, what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with the Netherlands in 2019? I think it is relevant for us. And I will try to tell you why I think this is the case. Earlier this year, on the 21st of March, Thierry Baudet, the leader of the new right-wing party Forum for Democracy, said that we are being destroyed, I quote, by the people who should be protecting us. We are being undermined by our universities, our journalists, by the people who receive our art subsidies and who design our buildings. And above all, we are being undermined by our governors, end quote. That Baudet started this part of his speech by attacking the truth-seeking truth institutions should not come as a surprise. At the universities, the political primacy of human rights and the moral primacy of individual freedoms are investigated, taught to students, and defended in various social sciences and humanities. At the universities, rhetoric and propaganda are distinguished from arguments by relying on the scientific method. Boudet would also like to get rid of judges that are restricting the popular will, whereas Nanda Audians explains that this is precisely what the separation of power in a liberal democracy entails. Baudet wants to weaken the critical function of the university, just as he is attacking other social institutions that are holding up mirrors to society. Judges that test governmental decisions against Dutch law or international law, or musea, that museums that engage in forms of art that hold us up mirrors regarding practices and traditions that are perceived as racist. Bearing Snyder's 20 lessons in mind, we must defend those institutions. We must defend the media, the museums, the judges, and the universities. Therefore, when Baudet gave his speech on the 21st of March, the leadership of Dutch universities and the Minister of Higher Education and Science should have immediately condemned his attack on the universities. On social media, many individual academics, especially colleagues working in the humanities and social science, put Baudet's statements in historical context and expressed great concern. But it remained quiet on the side of the VSNU, which should have spoken out in one voice. Of the individual universities, Karel Stolker, the rector magnificus of Leiden University, told his university's newspaper six weeks after Baudet's speech that he felt that the statement was unacceptable. I may be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, that was the only official condemnation of Baudet's statement by Dutch universities. And I find this worrying, because silence tolerates and normalizes such an institution undermining attack. Luckily, when Baudet announced a few weeks later that he would open a hotline where students could report it when they were indoctrinated by the political views of their teachers, the VSNU did react and wrote a press release saying that this was absurd, absurd and damaging to the working of the university. So what did the minister do after March 26th? First, interestingly, Minister van Engelshoven, who is currently our Minister of Higher Education and Science, immediately published a tweet in which she wrote that she found Baudet's statement that society is being undermined by our universities very reprehensible. I quote, we must stand up for academia. Society is built on work and knowledge of scientists, scholars, and teachers. We must protect academic freedom, not make it suspicious." End quote. The minister was right. This was an appalling statement. But sadly, 
one that fits in with the historical pattern of how democratically elected politicians aim at weakening liberal democracies. She deserves praise for doing what she, what the university leadership, for a reason I do not understand, did not do on March 20, 21st. Administrators and scientists must not remain silent when one of the university's core functions is attacked, in this case, critical um, scholarship. And this may show, perhaps, that university leadership views the university already too much from the point of view of its innovation function and insufficiently from the point of view of critical function. However, and strangely enough, the minister reaction also reveals a paradox of which she may well not be aware. Because on the one hand, she understands the danger of this statement, but she does not see that her own policies towards higher education, which prioritize the innovation and problem-solving function, weaken the university itself, especially its critical function. In her own policy, the minister mainly starts from the innovation function of the university and merely pays lip service to the curiosity-driven function. Scholars and researchers in universities are no longer put in the condition to fulfill the obligation they have to hold up a critical mirror towards society, to analyze and discuss societal trends, to explain and critically assess social institutions. Sometimes we are asked, why do you academics not engage more? Why don't you publish more pieces in the newspapers? Why don't you write popular books? Why don't you go on television and, and debate all these issues? But it, is, it has become increasingly difficult for academics to fulfill this critical function. And there are different reasons for this. One reason is that some groups of researchers are too dependent on industries with whom they have to collaborate. Due to the severe time pressure that affects them too, they often do not have to make, and that actually holds for all the groups, they often do not have the time to make a careful analysis, weigh all the aspects and properly prepare for media interviews. And hence, many professors simply decline. Moreover, academics might not be sure, they may doubt that the university will protect them in case they are attacked by members of the interest groups who do not like their critical reflections. So, the most rational thing for an academic to do is to take the safe road and not perform the critical analysis. One might even conclude that investigative journalism has taken over part of the role of the universities. They are better able to uncover truths that are important for societies. Think about the Panama Papers or the accounts that they have made of how the financial crisis were really dealt with. Perhaps it is just increasingly impossible for academic staff in universities to exercise a critical function. If I am right that the innovation and problem-solving function is becoming so dominant and that the general conditions for deciding genuinely and fully on one's own research and teaching again agenda have greatly diminished, then the critical function of scholars will increasingly try to find its way out of academia and new forms of research and scholarship will emerge in new places. The university, however, will then effectively change into the R&D department for the country and our economy. The critical research will move to organizations that are engaged in investigative journalism or will be taken up by non-fiction writers. However, I think this would be undesirable because as Robert Hutchins argues, argues convincingly, the university has this special protected role to perform this critical research and it's also crucial in teaching and educating of students. Hence, we must stand up for academic staff to be able to keep performing this critical role. The fact that the minister wants to strengthen the university the university's innovation function at the expense of its critical function is well illustrated by her recent decision to transfer, transfer some 70 million euros, mainly from the social sciences and humanities, to the natural sciences and technical sciences. For anybody who has followed the news, this is the so-called Van Rijn Kelder. Now, it is not the case that the critical function of the university is the prerogative or the exclusive task of the humanities and the social sciences, and that it would be absent in the natural or engineering sciences. 
This is a stereotype we often hear, but it is false. For one thing, all academic disciplines produce knowledge that leads to innovations and problem solving. Scholars from the humanities and the social sciences has also led to innovations that have great economic impact. For example, philosophy, and in particular logic, has made seminal contributions to the development of computer languages, and art historians and cultural scholars provide crucial input to the economic success successes of the cultural industry. And labor sociologists and psychologists develop strategies to avoid productivity losses in the workplace. And the stereotype is also not true from the other side, since there are plenty of natural scientists and engineers that provide critical commentaries on, on societal developments. For example, when architects critique current architectural practices for not being equally accommodating to people with different physical and sensory abilities and needs. But while I think that we must resist the simplistic stereotype, I think it's also nevertheless the case that the humanities and the social sciences are more likely to produce research that amounts to social criticism in comparison with the natural and the technical sciences. So, if the Minister of Higher Education and Sciences decides that it is a good policy to shift a significant amount of money that are very badly needed by the humanities and the social sciences, and that those are the disciplines that are making, in relative terms, the greatest contribution to the university's critical functioning, then that functioning will be weakened, while the sciences and the universities that are relatively most focused on innovation will be strengthened. Hence, the bad conditions for engaging in societal critique and to properly perform the duty of being a watchdog for society are further deteriorated. Moreover, apart from this material harm, there's also the harm that this policy causes in terms of the attitudes it conveys towards the critical function of the university. The minister and this government are essentially saying that the critical functioning of the university is not very important, or at least that this critical functioning function can to some extent be sacrificed in order to strengthen, strengthen the innovation and problem-solving function. Let me conclude. What should the university do in order to protect liberal democracies? The university should, first of all, explain why we have liberal democracies. It should provide critical commentary on politicians, citizens, journal journalists, ourselves, communities, and anybody else who attacks the institutions that are part of the division of power in liberal democracies. Professors should write books, op-ed pieces, and explain on television and radio how propaganda or dehumanization works, how a discourse that divides the citizen of that nation in two groups is a tactic that is one of the mechanisms that weakens liberal democracies and moves us into the direction of authoritarian regimes. Professors should write books and explain in the newspapers, on television and the radio, how framing works, which is knowledge that ordinary citizens can then apply to analyze political discourse, not just by politicians, but also by opinion leaders or journalists. Professors should write op-ed pieces criticizing existing institutions. And we could go on and on and on. The university serves many functions, not just being a watchdog for liberal democracies. We should also care about and protect our universities because they are like a public good. That is, a place where knowledge is created that everybody should be able to access for all future generations. So we have reason enough to protect our universities, to cherish them, to fund them properly so that they can enact all their functions. We should warn ourselves to not to reduce the role of the universities in democracies to innovation and problem solving, because that's not the only reason why we have universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Robbins, for 
reminding us and elaborating on the functions of universities, on what the role of criticism in a society is and critical thinking, and helping us realize that we should care about this and try and protect this. As board member of the University of Technology, I would like to uh, give a slight view on my opinion. 20 years from now, I'm pretty sure that we will look back and be surprised that we split up thinking in alpha, beta and gamma. The world is simply too complex to allow that to be separated. We need to collaborate. We need to embrace what humanities can say. Humanities need to help engineers and uh, have a feel for what engineering and science brings to society. With an aging population, I see many people that have as little hair as I have. There is no other way than cooperating, keeping this society as healthy as we can. Having said that, I would like to invite back our musicians for their second musical interlude. Please re-welcome Ensemble Interspinas. Thanks very much for the beautiful music. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the next item of this evening, the Makel Prize Award ceremony. And it's my privilege to um, be chairing this. The Makel Prize is awarded to the most responsible innovation at TU Delft. Over the past decade, responsible innovation has become a central concern in innovation policies and the funding of R&D programs. Responsible innovation may be defined as aligning research and innovation with the needs and values of society. As a university, we consider it important that our researchers and students think upfront of ethical questions and include such considerations in research and innovation. This year we had 10 applications. There were many good applications, some addressing urgent societal problems, like nitro the nitrogen crisis that we are currently facing in the Netherlands, or the need for improve, improved renewable energy storage and conversion. Others addressed societal issues in relation to self-driving cars, or the need for affordable MRI scans in Africa. Also, the societal problem that people on internet increasingly only get, the, get to see news feed from uh, that. Let me rephrase this. Also, the societal problem that people on internet increasingly only get to see news feeds that reinforce their existing opinions was addressed. So the jury had a difficult time to make a choice. In choosing a winner, the jury looked at six criteria. Is the innovation aimed at solving a societal challenge? Does it take societal values into account? Are possible risks anticipated and addressed? Did the innovation process include relevant societal stakeholders? Was the innovation process transparent? And the sixth one, was it a truly innovative idea? As you see me stumbling every once in a while, it's my eyesight. The letters are rather small, so it's difficult to read. The winner is a project that scored well on all these criteria. It addresses a societal challenge that we might all recognize. If on societal media like Facebook, we click on news stories that we like, we are more likely to get similar stories in the future. And we are less likely to get news that contradicts our opinions and beliefs. Social media thus tend to reinforce our opinions and to reduce opposing voices. That's called a filter bubble or echo chamber. This is perhaps most visible in the US, but it's happening here as well. Filter bubbles potentially undermine our democracy but there are also technologies that might help to overcome them. And that is exactly what the winning project tries to do. It's a project of Nava Tintarev called Explana Explanation 
interfaces for decision making. The project is aimed at devising algorithms that help to break through bubble filters. Instead, it tries to present people with a diversity of viewpoints. Now this might sound simple, but it's not. One issue is that when people are presented with news that they find surprising or that goes against their viewpoint, it may undermine their trust in the news medium. Another issue is that diversity should not become an excuse to present news that is known to be false or that is disrespectful. Think example of racist viewpoints. And it is anyway hard to decide how much attention different viewpoints should get. Scientific skepticism about climate change should probably get less attention than the majority viewpoint among scientists. The winner tries to find solutions to these problems, for example, through the curation of news or by designing interfaces that help to present different viewpoints better. Not only is this technically innovative, it's also done in close dialogue with the media industry and through focus groups with users. What is particularly interesting about the project is that it does not just aim to present news better, but also wants to contribute to critical thinking. Making such a contribution is, as was argued earlier this evening, an important task of the university. It's also a major aim in our education at TU Delft. We want to educate engineers that are not only technically the best, but are also able to think critically. I would last ask the winner Nara, Nava Tinterev to come forward. And I would also like to invite Professor Van der Poel to help out. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to close this meeting, but there are two things that I would like to mention. First one is that on May 7th, 2020, so that's roughly half a year from now, we'll have another of the Van Hasselt lectures in the Prinzenhof, where we usually have that. One, it's not as cold and it's a different time of the year, so that will help as well. And you're absolutely all invited to come where we have as keynote speaker Samuel Schleffer of New York University. I hope to see you all there, of course. Second, and last thing before I really close, I hope you realize that you got homework. There's a 10 page paper that all of us need to try and find and read, as you mentioned. <laughs> Don't forget. If you show up on May 7, 2020, I might question you whether you read it or not. <laughs> but perhaps I may, uh, may not do so. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being present and uh, making this another very, very interesting and motivating evening. We'll have some drinks on your left side, my right hand. Everybody can keep his coat on if you want. I'm going to put on mine as well. Thank you very much to our speakers and our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, this session is closed. Thank you. Thank you.